So today will be about the management of infectious diseases in football. Um, and you will see that uh, some of the insights into this management are not necessarily football specific, but uh, we can discuss later um, about um, what might be the consequences for football or what uh, if, if you think that the um, derivations that I have made are um, appropriate or not. Um, because uh, we are still in the COVID pandemic or maybe in the, in the very last part of it, um, in some places I will make some remarks about um, the virus disease uh, of SARS CoV-2. So first of all, there is no conflict of interest um, on my side. And um, the um, infection management is typically um, parted in three distinct areas. So the first one is the primary prevention. That means avoiding infections. Um, the second one is uh, when it has occurred. So the acute management of the infectious diseases including a diagnosis and treatment. So um, these are the three stages of infection management, which I have already spoken about. So I don't think that I need to restart this because it's it's just the background of it and you, most of you will know it. Um, there are mainly three threats for, um, for athletes and for football players uh, from infectious diseases. The first of all, first of all, is the impaired performance. That is what everybody feels when you feel sick, when you feel malaise. So um, that can be either a local malfunction of organs, not necessarily a dysfunction, um, but it is mainly due to humoral factors. That means the body sends some signals. Um, the body produces um, interleukins and similar substances which makes you or which make the athlete feel sick. Of course, um, there is also the possibility of organ affection. Um, and the most serious one of these is probably myocarditis. And I will come back to that in a few seconds again, because it is um, probably in the core of all our efforts to um, manage infectious disease as well to avoid myocarditis. And of course, we have a long-term sequelae of uh, infectious diseases, which is uh, um, called the post-viral or the post-infection fatigue syndrome, or in the in the context of COVID, um, some call it long COVID, although we know comparably little about that. Um, the best known disease with um, post-viral fatigue syndrome is Epstein-Barr virus, so kissing disease. Um, let me expand a little bit about myocarditis. And what you can see here is data from the German uh, registry, which is not football specific, but the majority of cases in this registry comes from football. And uh, interestingly, you can see that um, on the upper right quadrant, um, almost a quarter of all cases of sudden cardiac death and arrests are from myocarditis. So this looks like a, um, like a prevalence in, in the upper range and at least in the young players. So in this case, it is below 35 years of age. Um, it is the most prevalent cause under the German circumstances. When we have a look into France, and please only um, have a look at the upper circle, there you can see that they only had a 4% prevalence of myocarditis in their, um, in, in their population of athletes dying from cardiac diseases. However, in this uh, sample from France, the cyclists are um, overproportionally represented and football is only number three, unlike Germany. And another example comes from the United States. Here we find a 6% um, six percent incidence in U.S. athletes below 40 years of age, and also here, football players, so soccer players, are um, included as a at a much lower percentage than in the German registry. So, so what is true now? Um, maybe a look into the worldwide FIFA registry can help. 
So you can see on the left hand side um, the data from all ages. That means older players are included, but we should possibly rather focus on the right hand side of the slide where the players under 35 years of age are summarized. And again, we have um, a percentage of myocarditis that is um, in the range of five. So possibly there are either differences between countries or differences in the diagnostic process. At least there is a relevant percentage of myocarditis following infectious diseases, not just in athletes, but also in football players. Um, now let us focus a little bit on, on uh, COVID. And uh, you may remember that in the early stages of COVID, we had a few data coming out indicating a particularly high um, prevalence of myocarditis in athletes uh, after COVID-19. Um, however, fortunately, later larger athlete samples were investigated and probably the, the, lar the, the largest one, at least that I know, comes from the United States. And as you can see in this table, um, it is from the four major professional leagues in the United States. And I have put um, red square around uh, the soccer players. 70 of them are included in almost 800 athletes of the entire sample. Um, it is not possible to distinguish them um, in the final result, but what becomes obvious, and I, I like to guide your view to the lower to, to the bottom right of this um, figure, only five of these almost 800 athletes were diagnosed with inflammatory heart disease, three of them with myocarditis and two with pericarditis. So this is clearly below 1% and in the range of other viral diseases. So obviously COVID-19 and these data come from the time when the alpha and delta variant were most prevalent. Obviously, COVID-19 is not a virus that is, that is overproportionately prone to make myocarditis. And given that we have now the milder variant of Omicron, the risk is probably even lower. Based on that, um, a very, very good um, publication has come from um, a working group in Hungary uh, with the first author Liliana Shabo, and they it, it, they kind of investigated if it makes sense to put athletes of, or football players after uh, COVID-19 into an MRI. And for that purpose, they investigated 147 athletes um, and had a control group of non-affected athletes. And after really thorough comparison between both groups and between the findings um, and findings. Um, in, in other in, in case of other viral diseases, the consequence and the conclusion from this investigation was that the cardiac involvement uh, in uh, COVID-19 disease is rather low. And um, they caution against the routine use of um, cardiac MRI in asymptomatic uh, football players and asymptomatic, asymptomatic athletes. This is accompanied by a uh, an editorial uh, um, from a group around Domenico Corrado, who is a very famous um, cardiologist from Italy, and you probably know him. Um, so he also advises against routine conduction of cardiac MRI in asymptomatic athletes. Instead, he recommends a maximal exercise test because the main concern is arrhythmia induced by exercise. And uh, in contrast to the uh, general eligibility screenings where he does not recommend that. He is in favor of it after COVID-19 disease. So that's probably a much more basic approach than putting all athletes into the cardiac MRI. But this is far-reaching management of infectious disease and uh, it reveals that it doesn't make sense to go that far. But now let's go back to our a three category approach and let's have a look at primary prevention first and when we think about primary prevention the, i think the first thing that comes to a mind of a physician is always vaccination vaccination in elite athletes 
is something not well investigated. And if you have a look into this review article that I had the opportunity to write together with Barbara Gärtner, you will see that this is a bit more of an expert opinion than very well evidence based. Um, however, we tried to balance um, the, the benefits from vaccination, particularly in athletes, against the risks from vaccination, particularly in athletes, and both are considered higher than in the general population. So the outcome of uh, this balancing was that we had a quite offensive recommendation to do a lot of uh, vaccinations and not be so cautious about vaccinating athletes. And there is no reason why these recommendations cannot be um, applied also in, in a football-specific setting. Um, I don't go through all these diseases in, uh, in detail, but maybe we can discuss some of them later after the talk. Um, How is the situation in elite football? Typically, at least this is my experience, the vaccination status is quite unclear because documentation is less than perfect. However, probably there are differences between countries under the ger German circumstances. The vaccination status is frequently unknown. Um, and in those ones where it is well documented, it is rather below average um, of, the, of the general population. Why is that? Um, mostly because there are large concerns regarding side effects which may, may interfere with training. And uh, on top of that, when you talk to coaches, players, and even to team doctors, you sometimes hear that they are concerned about the lacking immune response in an ongo during an ongoing training period. So overall, there is large skepticism and the vaccination discipline is comparably low. Is that justified? Probably not. Um, and I'd like to show you some data, albeit from um, a study in, in, uh, in influ with influenza vaccination, which um, was conducted already uh, slightly more than five years ago and which has been published in uh, two different journals. Um, and I'd like to summarize the results of that quite shortly. So we recruited 45 elite athletes and um, compared them to 25 uh, age matched controls. Um, and we applied an influenza vaccination um, in the German autumn. So when it is typically applied, um, it was either given at the uh, shortly after the end of a training session in half of the athletes or uh, on the very next day before the next training session. Um, you can see that is, it was a mixed sample of uh, different disciplines who are mainly represented at our Olympic Training Center. And this was all done through, an ongo through ongoing training. So there was no modification of the training schedule uh, for this study. After uh, Before the vaccination, one week, two weeks later, and half a year later, there was an immunological control and diary for side effects was uh, was made by the by the play, uh, by the athletes from two days prior to the first vaccination to two weeks after it. Now, sorry, I said first vaccination. As you may probably know, influenza vaccination is uh, a, a one-time vaccination, um, which is a dead vaccine. So here you can see the results um, uh, on the left-hand side, the comparison between control group and athletes. Um, and um, I, on the right-hand side, the comparison between those athletes vaccinated right after training to those ones vaccinated about one day later. Um, you can see the antibody response. So these are neutralizing antibodies, the antibodies that, um, well, that, that give the most uh, reliable immunity. And for, for both the H1 N1 uh, antigen, as well as for the H3 N2 one, um, you can see that the athletes on average have a slightly higher response. Um, however, we don't want to overinterpret this in this comparably small sample 
but at least they don't show a lower response. And on the right hand side, you can see that it does not really matter in terms of the um, in, in terms of the antibody response if you vaccinate immediately after the training session or the very next day. The same is true for the um, for the cellular immune response, which is mainly responsible for the causes of disease. And uh, you can see, at least for the first two weeks after vaccination, that the response in athletes on the left-hand side, on the figure on the left-hand side, the response in athletes is slightly better than in control subjects, um, whereas after half a year, it's uh, not distinguishable anymore. And again, um, the response between two hours within two hours after exercise uh, to compared to one day later is about the same. So overall, you can say that the immune response is really the same. I have not shown you any data about the side effects, but I can assure you, and you can check that in the respective articles, that there was no relevant difference either. So generally, we can summarize that there are definitely no convincing reasons not to vaccinate football players and uh, definitely the efficacy is about the same. Other studies confirm this. Um, and however, still we have a low number of uh, studies addressing this topic, which might mean that uh, there is something left to do in the future, particularly for COVID-19 vaccinations about which nothing has yet been published in athletes. There are some specificities in football players. So definitely with a typical fixture congestion, as we find it in um, the high uh, professional leagues, it is not easy finding a good point, good time point for vaccination, at least when you assume that there is at least some side effects. Well, these 45 athletes in our, stu in our study did not modify their training schedule at all. So in, in their case, it was possible to um, continue training without any interruptions, without any um, time loss. However, in a larger number of athletes, of course, it may still happen that some side effects occur and interfere with training. Um, also, in, in, in football teams, there may occur group effects, and you may have seen that during the COVID crisis, um, and if, if ones are concerned about side effects, that may quickly transfer to their teammates. Primary prevention is, of course, not only about vaccination, um, but also about avoiding um, disease acquisition by other behaviors or by other, me other measures. Um, and you will probably know um, most of these from the from the past 24 or 28 months. Um, so for respiratory um, infectious agents, uh, even outside football, it is uh, obviously a strategy that works if you limit the number of contact persons, or at least you limit the contact to persons who show um, suspicious symptoms. And that is, again, social distancing, wearing, wearing masks, etc. Um, I don't think that we have to go into detail here. Um, so this is definitely um, an effective method, which, of course, finds, finds its limitations um, in the social interaction that any player has at home or even in the dressing room. Um, on top of that, of course, hygiene measures can be um, intensified in, in, uh, in other terms as well. So mainly this is about hand hygiene and the use of disinfectants. And it is well illustrated on this slide what happens um, if you put um, a contaminated hand without any washing, without any disinfection on an agar plate. So you can see that several um, bacterial cultures grow out of that. Whereas uh, with after washing your hands, it's it's slightly reduced, but when a disinfection takes place, uh, you don't find these um, cultures anymore. And in the meantime, which is probably a positive result of the pandemic, um, these uh, 
devices that give you quick access to disinfectant um, are distributed all over dressing rooms, all over stadiums. So it should not be a problem anymore to disinfect hands of athletes frequently over a day. A point that is often found in team settings is so-called finger food. So sharing finger food um, of different kind is definitely something that should be avoided and it can easily be avoided. So something to possibly pay attention to. Do we really have evidence for this? Well, if we are looking for football specific evidence, we will probably find nothing. Even if we have a look at sports specific evidence, there is very little. However, um, evidence for this comes from general medicine, of course, and uh, particularly those ones of you who are, who are working in surgery settings know that uh, it, is, it is well evidenced that these steps at least reduce the transmission of infectious diseases. There is one relatively famous study, maybe methodologically uh, less than perfect, but still well published and well referenced. That is um, about the um, Norwegian team that took part in the Winter Olympics 2006 in Turin and 2010 in Vancouver. Um, and this has been published already in 2011 in the, um, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And you can see at first sight on the lower left, um, this is the number of um, infectious diseases occurring in 2010, whereas the number in the other um, box in the other table on the right hand side of the slide is much higher. Of course, this is not a planned study. This is not a, a prospectively planned protocol, but at least in terms of numbers, it's a reduction. Um, and this has led to even recommendations of uh, the IOC uh, to include the measures that the Norwegian team has taken um, after the seemingly high infection rate in 2006. So what did they do? They educated their staff members uh, by information letters, they had a website, and they had um, meetings with the medical staff. Um, those measures were monitored during the preparation phase, and on top of that, all athletes were screened for allergies and asthma and other airway problems. Those ones who had airway problems uh, were put in single rooms, which is not always the case during Olympic Games. Um, the whole team was vaccinated against influenza and pertussis, and it, uh, the, the team management distributed disinfection gels and plastic covers for carpets and air cleaning systems. And on top of that, they reduced the physical contacts between teammates. You may remember this has happened already in 2010. So measures that became more popular and more well known in COVID already were successfully applied in uh, the Norwegian team in 2010. On the right hand side of this slide, you see a poster. This poster is something that can be downloaded from um, several websites, including the one from the BJSM, and can be put into dressing rooms, for example, and lists um, the measures that can be taken together with nice illustrations that explain the measures to all athletes, um, in, in, uh, to all athletes and represent guidelines for, the, for disease prevention. So next step, if um, primary prevention has failed, is the acute management of uh, the disease. And the very first step for each physician is, of course, the history taking and the physical examination. And this is sometimes underestimated, I think, and technical uh, examinations are overestimated in turn. Um, but the clinical science of generalization should definitely be checked. Um, Measurement of fever is is a, a is the basic um, is a basic step to be taken. Um, this is frequently by coaches in football regarded as the only sign for the only relevant sign for infectious diseases, 
which of course is everything else than true. So even if an adult player does not have fever, uh, he or she can still have general uh, signs of generalization. Another one is fatigue and malaise, or something like a flu-like feeling. When you talk to, to your athletes, to your players, and you know them well, I think you have a feeling of when they develop that. You can also ask if they feel ill more locally, or if they have a sense of their whole body being affected. And a purely clinical sign is swollen lymph nodes, of course. Um, I think, in, in at least in each professional setting, um, laboratory indicators should supplement the clinical information. Um, the most basic one is, an, is the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. However, this is maybe a bit outdated, and uh, the only advantage of it is that it can be that it can be applied in any setting. Even if you're far out in the desert in a training camp, you can still do that without a proper laboratory at hand. But the most sensitive um, laboratory indicator is the C-reactive protein, um, and if that is increased. Um, it is definitely an indicator for an infectious disease. Based on CRP alone, you can hardly make a distinction um, which infectious agent is present. Interestingly, in athletes and also in football players with uh, considerable, uh, considerable um, endurance capacity, um, CRP is typically very low. So even an increase which is still within the reference range, might indicate early disease. So it makes sense to have a determination of, ink of CRP with a high sensitive kit. A leukocytosis um, is something that is not always found in viral disease, but typically in um, bacterial disease. And once again, in uh, players with a good endurance capacity, um, leukocyte count at rest in a healthy state is typically a bit, little bit below um, population average values. Um, if you make a differential blood count, this may help to identify the infectious agent. So neutrophilia and, lymph, uh, and in contrast, lymphocytosis um, might be interpreted in, uh, um, in the direction of neutrophilia, um, bacterial disease, and lymphocytosis, rather a viral disease. However, this is not a certain sign and should always be combined, combined with the clinical indicators. And finally, um, of course, there are many inflammatory proteins and mediators on top of uh, CRP. Um, however, they are expensive, they are not established, and they are not part of the usual workup in case of infectious diseases. Together with my colleague Jürgen Schahak from Vienna University, um, I have put together an article already in, uh, I think, 2014 um, about the return to play after acute infectious diseases in football players. And... Uh, it, it emphasizes that football training um, cannot only be um, about football training. You cannot only decide um, in the sense of yes or no. It is definitely possible to um, participate in football training in a modified manner, or only participate in parts of it. Um, it is of particular importance to, to monitor the circulatory strain because this is regarded the most important factor to decide about myocarditis risk or not. To be honest, evidence for this mainly comes from animal studies. However, um, it is by, by most experts regarded the most relevant factor. So if there is still remaining um, infectious disease, cardiocirculatory strain should be held low. And uh, in a typical football training session as it is conducted today. Um, the most dangerous training mode is probably the small-sided games because they include a very high intensity. In fact, they are um, they're carried out to reach high intensities. The algorithm that we put together um, has been summarized in a figure in that article. 
Um, and it is quite simple. Um, so there is always history and physical examination and also the venous blood sample is included, as I told you. Additional examinations are not always necessary, but always if there is the slightest indication of cardiac involvement, an ECG and ultrasound should be conducted um, and should be at hand in a professional setting. Um, and only if there is an abnormality in these examinations, further follow-up um, ex um, further follow-up follows. And if they are normal and the player is asymptomatic again, return to play is possible. So I think this is a straightforward algorithm to decide about the return to play in, in football players and, and might be useful. Once again, coming back to, um, to COVID-19, there have been um, some return to play recommendations published one from the United States already as far back as 2020. And uh, if you have a look at the red circles here, um, it confirms what I have already said in the beginning. Um, consideration of cardiac MRI is only recommended uh, under very, very specific circumstances. So for example, if symptoms reoccur after they have already for a few days disappeared, or if there has been heavily symptomatic disease with hospitalization, and even then it is not always necessary, but should be considered. Overall, the approach is quite defensive and cardiac MRI is not, uh, not recommended in many cases. The German recommendations, which have been published recently, um, take into account the developments in the Omicron time. And you can see in the red circle that the the time between the first diagnosis and uh, first competition has been reduced to only 10 days and it may even be shorter when there is a continuous medical care from team doctors. The third pillar of infection management is secondary prevention. This means um, avoidance of reoccurrence of symptoms, avoidance of um, long-term disease, and particularly the avoidance of transmission to teammates. Um, it's been well documented in an American football team that, uh, that it may happen that quickly the entire team gets affected when um, um, when care is not taken to avoid that. In this case, um, it is for an outbreak of norovirus in a team um, and the transmission occurred via fomites. So I, I, this is an article that I'd, I'd like to recommend to you. Um, it is um, freely available and uh, it, is, it is well described there. Um, how the cause of the disease, how the transmission of the infectious agents occurred in this team and how it could be possibly um, avoided. In the outbreak literature um, from professional or from competitive sport, you do find very little. So um, a first review, which has been published as early as 2006, um, emphasized that the most common transmission mode was direct person-to-person -person contact, so skin-to-skin. -skin. And the most frequently um, involved diseases for outbreaks were skin infections. This is confirmed in another study, which was published a few years later. However, if you have a look at the table, soccer is only, so football, our football is, is only included with one study. All other studies came from other sports. And finally, a larger review coming from France. Therefore, they use the term football instead of soccer. Um, it includes several football studies, but most of them, once again, focus on cutaneous so skin diseases. Um, does that all mean that outbreaks um, are not a big issue in football? or in terms of team sports? Probably not. There are, there are large examples prior to European championships, prior to World Cups, um, 
where um, outbreaks of respiratory diseases occurred in several countries. Uh, in many instances, it was measles, once it was Escherichia coli, and uh, in Brazil, it was the Zika virus, and together with some more endemic diseases. So overall, it may still happen, although not well documented in the literature, that team settings of football can be affected by infectious diseases. So what can you do to avoid transmission? Of course, isolation is one measure and it's quite pop. It's been quite popular in football um, already before the pandemic. And the measures to avoid um, transmission from one team member to the other, of course, are not different are not different from the ones that are useful for the acquisition of the disease from outside of um, the team. So it's a reduction of contact, it's social distancing and uh, limiting the number of contact persons. Um, on the other hand side, and this is mainly true for gastro, uh, this is this is true for, for respiratory diseases like influenza, but also for, um, for gastrointestinal diseases, with diarrhea, it is hand hygiene and the use of disinfectants. And if we go into a football setting, um, it is typically relatively difficult to realize these reductions of body contact and uh, the social distancing in a team setting, not so much on the pitch, but in the dressing room, in the meeting room. So relatively difficult to realize that. On the other hand side, the hygiene measures for hand hygiene, they are in fact doable. And as already mentioned earlier, the devices for that are now present um, as a consequence of the pandemic. Let me make a final um, remark about parenterally um, transmitted infections like HIV, like hepatitis B. Um, are they really a topic in a team sport like football? Um, this, the story behind this is we were asked um, in, in the German uh, Medical Committee about 10 years ago because uh, there was a player uh, who had HIV. We were asked um, by a team of how to handle that. And for that reason, we um, collected a number of, of colleagues from infectiology um, and uh, put together a text advising the all the teams and basically it says that the transmission of these diseases in football is very very low it is higher for hepatitis b hepatitis b because it's so contagious than for hiv but still for hepatitis b um, there are no procedures necessary to avoid transmission beyond the regular medical hygiene procedures that should be in place anyway. Um, what could be discussed is a mandatory use of gloves on the pitch, also because it sets an example. Um, you will easily see that the use of uh, gloves is established in some countries, whereas in others it's not. Um, on the other hand side, in, in a regular hospital setting, um, all the measures being uh, done on the pitch would rather would typically be done with uh, gloves on the hands. So this is this is something to be considered. But besides that, um, the typical hygiene procedures seem to be sufficient. Even mandatory vaccination or mandatory information of the teammates and the opponents what was not considered necessary because the transmission likelihood is so low. It should be noted that the NCAA in the United States um, has stricter rules um, and the reason given for that is that they want to eliminate uh, hepatitis B carriers. I'm not so sure if this is really reached by these stricter measures, but um, that's um, what they report as the main reason. Let me summarize all that. Um, Definitely infectious diseases are a relevant cause for time loss in all levels of football play. Although the outbreaks, as they are documented in the scientific literature, are relatively rare and mostly 
consist of skin infections and gastrointestinal diseases. Um, this does not mean that they are impossible. COVID-19 gives a good example of that, and we have seen outbreaks in several teams. Um, however, they do not seem to be from activities on the pitch, but rather from um, sitting together and being close to each other in the dressing room and in meeting rooms. There is no reason not to vaccinate football players. However, you can only avoid certain diseases by these vaccinations, of course. There is no indication that the efficacy of vaccination is lower in football players or that the occurrence rate of side effects is particularly high. COVID-19 has taught us several lessons which uh, can be applied in a football setting in, in the future as well. Um, and coming back to what I have discussed as measures for um, the avoidance of disease acquisition, I can only repeat myself and emphasize that basic measures like hand disinfection, like uh, hand washing and simple distancing um, should not be underestimated. In fact, they are probably the most effective means to avoid transmission of infectious disease. Thank you very much, and I'm open to your questions.